If you've taken a math class, you've probably used a calculator to calculate values of sine, cosine, and other functions plenty of times before. But have you ever wondered how they actually do it? I'll give you a hint, it's not with wizards. In this video, I'll introduce the process of how a computer might go about calculating these values, and where the ideas behind it come from, and hopefully give you a deeper understanding of how math is done on computers. To get started, we'll look at sine and cosine on the unit circle. If we can find the x and y coordinates of a line with a length of 1, then we found the sine and cosine of the angle that that line makes. Since the cosine of theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse, or x over 1, and sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse, or y over 1. More generally, for a line with length r, x is r times the cosine of theta, and y is r times the sine of theta, since we multiply by r on both sides. Okay, I want you to imagine something. Say we're on some line, and we have a point at the beginning of the line. We want our point to move some distance, but we only know how to move in steps of predetermined size each time we move, meaning the only choice we're allowed to make is which direction we take our step in. In this case, we'll choose steps that are 5, then half of that, then half of that, then half of that, and so on, in length. Since each step gets smaller, if we move forward if we're behind the distance we want, and backward if we're in front of it, we'll eventually converge to that point that we're looking for. Sort of a selectively alternating series of steps. You can see that after just a few steps, we're already pretty close to our desired distance. And by the end, we're only 0. 0.0002 units away from the actual distance we want it to be at. Now if we take that example of walking on a line and apply it to the unit circle, we can rotate some vector by an angle of 45 degrees, then half of that, then half of that, and so on. This series can be represented as 45 times 1 over 2 to the n. And if we have infinite terms in that series, it'll eventually converge to 90 degrees. What that means is that we're able to reach any point in this first quadrant of the unit circle, or the first 90 degrees. And because we can also rotate backwards, it means we can also reach any point in the fourth quadrant, or negative 90 degrees. Finally, since the left side of the circle is just the right side but with negative x-coordinates, if we adjust the x-coordinate beforehand, rotate the vector up to it, and then flip the x-coordinate again at the end, then we can reach both sides of the circle. Okay, great. So we can use this same series of angles to rotate a vector to any angle on the unit circle. But how does that help us? Well, let's choose some angle on the unit circle, and we'll selectively rotate our vector back and forth until we reach that angle. If that vector has length 1, then the x-coordinate of the vector will be the cosine of the angle that the vector makes, and the y-coordinate will be the sine of the angle. We could also use this method going backwards. For example, inverse tangent of y over x is the angle that the vector makes. So if we rotate the vector back and forth until it's on the x-axis, and keep track of the sum of the angles that we rotated it by, then we'll get the angle that the vector makes, or the inverse tangent of y over x. So ideally, what we want to do is given a vector of a unit length 1, find the new x and y coordinates of that same vector rotated a certain number of degrees. That way, after all those rotations converging to that angle, if we still have our x and y coordinates, then we found the cosine and sine of the angle we want. As we saw before, we can express a vector's x and y coordinates in terms of its angle and magnitude, where the x coordinate is r times the cosine of theta, and the y coordinate is r times the sine of theta. If we rotate that vector by some new angle alpha, where the total angle is now theta plus alpha, then the x coordinate will be r times the cosine of theta plus alpha, and the y will be r times the sine of theta plus alpha. This is a good first step, but ideally what we want is to express the new coordinates of the vector solely in terms of alpha, x, and y. That way we won't have to calculate the angle theta that the vector already makes. To do that, we're going to have to move to a geometrical proof. We'll construct a triangle with a hypotenuse of length 1, and then we'll divide this corner in the bottom left into two angles, x and y. This way the right side of the triangle is sine of x plus y, and the bottom side is cosine x plus y. Our goal is to be able to express this sine or cosine of x plus y with just sine or cosine of x and sine or cosine of y. If we sort of draw some more lines here and label some more points, you'll see that the sine of x plus y line, bc, is equal to bf plus fc. 
through some angle hopping, we can also see that the angle in the top right of the triangle is the same y degrees as the angle in the bottom left. What this means is that the line BF is equal to sine of x times the cosine of y, and the line FC is equal to the cosine of x times the sine of y. Therefore, the total line sine of x plus y equals sine of x times cosine of y plus cosine x times sine of y. Now looking at cosine of x plus y, that total side length is equal to AE minus CE. Again, after doing some rearranging, we find that AE is equal to cosine x times cosine y, and CE equals sine x times sine y. Therefore, the total side length cosine x plus y equals cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y. We can take these new equations for sine of x plus y and cosine of x plus y, and substitute them into our original equations for our new x and our new y, x prime and y prime. Remember that we said for some vector with length r, x was equal to r times the cosine of theta, and y was equal to r times the sine of theta. If we distribute the r in our equations for x prime and y prime, we can then substitute in x for any terms that are r cosine theta, and y for any terms that are r sine theta. Now we can see that our new rotated points coordinates can be expressed only in terms of the original x and y coordinates and the angle alpha that they're being rotated by, which are all values that we already know. Since we have a linear system of equations here, where x and y are multiplied by constants and then added together to create x prime and y prime, what we can do is move this equation into an expression of matrix vector multiplication. Using a matrix here is really useful for expressing our rotation formula, since it lets us describe it with only one equation. The way you multiply matrices with vectors is by taking the dot product of the row of the matrix with the column of the vector. In this case, we get x prime equals x times cosine alpha minus y sine alpha, and y prime equals x sine alpha plus y cosine alpha. In the end, using a matrix is representing the same thing as our equations. It just makes it more concise and easy to work with. Okay, so now we have a way to rotate vectors and get their x and y coordinates after we rotate them. That gives us our sine and cosine of the angle that we want. There is one problem though. Multiplication on computers is not exactly fast. Let's look at an example. This is my 8-bit computer, which I've sort of wired together messily. It's based off of a design by Ben Eater, but it also includes some of my own changes. Now, this thing is way too complicated to get into how it works for this video. But what I am going to do is run a multiplication program on it and kind of walk you through the basics of how it works. So what I'll do first is plug in this Arduino to program the RAM. That's just where the program is stored for the computer to run. Once it's done programming, I'll quickly reset it. And then I'll start the clock, which just starts the program running. So the basic way this program works is we're multiplying the number 7 by the number 16. We'll keep track of one variable, a, and we'll store that as 7. Then for the variable b, we'll store 16 in there. Lastly, we have another variable, p, which will be our product or the result of our multiplication, which we'll set to zero. Multiplication is really just repeated addition. So when we say seven times 16, what we mean is 16 seven times. So what we'll do here to multiply is we'll take the value in B and add it to P as long as A is greater than zero. Each time we add B to P, we'll subtract one from A. That way, since A is seven, it means we'll have added 16 seven times. It's a bit difficult to see this in action on the computer, but it'll only be about five more minutes, so we'll just let it sit here. Okay, just kidding, I'll speed it up. After all of that repeated addition, you see the computer gets the same result, 112. Although this algorithm for multiplication is simple, it's really slow and it takes a lot of moving results around and a lot of operations. Computers operate on a clock pulse, which is that blinking light you see in the top left. Generally, computers can only do a few things per clock pulse. So if we can minimize the number of operations something takes, we can minimize the amount of clock pulses it takes, and thus the amount of time it takes. It turns out that when multiplying by certain types of numbers on a computer, we can calculate the result much faster in a certain way. Computers are built on a binary number system, where each digit in a number is a power of 2 instead of a power of 10. What this means is that a number like 1010101 10, 
is 2 to the 7 plus 2 to the 5 plus 2 to the 3 plus 2 to the 1, or 170. Now watch what happens if I shift all the digits in the number 1 to the right. The new value becomes 01010101, and the decimal value becomes 85. This is exactly half of the 170 that we had before. You've probably already seen this in decimal numbers. If we were to divide 85 by 10, we'd get 8.5, which is the same as moving all of the digits to the right. And if we multiply by 10, we get 85 again, moving the digits to the left. In binary, it's the same concept, just with dividing by 2 and multiplying by 2, since the system itself is base 2. What that means is that anytime we're multiplying or dividing by 2 or a power of 2, we can calculate the result just by shifting the digits to the right or left. To use this in our algorithm, we'll factor out a cosine out of our matrix from before. That way the matrix is 1 negative tan, tan 1. So now we'll look for angles whose tangents are powers of 2. In other words, the nth angle is the inverse tangent of 2 to the negative n. That way when we take the tangent of the angle and multiply it by x and y, all we're doing is dividing x or y by 2 or shifting the digits one place to the right. One thing you may have picked up on is that we've now changed the way that we're choosing our angles. Rather than being 45, then half of 45, then half of that, and so on, our new angles are inverse tangents of 1 half, then 1 fourth, then 1 eighth, then so on. Remember that the reason that that original series worked was because first of all, it converged to a finite number, and second of all, it covered at least 90 degrees of the unit circle in both directions. If we rotate our vector starting on the x-axis by this new series of inverse tangent angles, you'll see that the value is greater than 90 degrees, meaning we can cover the entire unit circle once again. But how do we know that this series actually converges to a finite value? If we write out our angle series as a summation, it looks like the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of the inverse tangent of 1 over 2 to the n, with the terms looking like 45, then 22.625, and so on. One way we can know if this series converges is by looking at the ratio of the next term in the series over the previous term as we approach infinity. If that ratio is less than 1, it means the next term is less than the previous term, meaning the terms are getting smaller even as we go all the way to infinity, so it must converge. If we plug in our n plus 1th term and our nth term as n approaches infinity, we get this expression. What you might notice is that both of these terms actually go to 0. So how are we to evaluate this limit? Let's look at a graph of two functions whose limits as we approach some point both equal 0. Although the ratio of these functions at this point is 0 divided by 0, because we're looking at a limit, we're asking not for the ratio at the point, but for the ratio as we approach the point. For that reason, we'll look a small value dx away from that point and look at the change in the y value of both functions, dy. As dx approaches 0, the ratio of dy to dy becomes more and more accurate of the ratio of the two functions. Our goal is to find this ratio dy over dy. So if we take a derivative of both functions, top and bottom, the dx's will go away and we'll be left with that limiting ratio dy over dy, giving us the actual value of the limit. I'll use that approach here and take the derivative of top and bottom separately, then simplify. And evaluating the limit, we get that the ratio of the next term to the previous term as we approach infinity is 1 half. This means that the terms are shrinking as we approach infinity, and therefore the series must converge. We've got all the pieces of the puzzle now. Let's go over a quick recap of what we've covered. First we realized that by iteratively rotating angles, we could converge to any angle on the unit circle. If we could find the x and y coordinates of a vector who had been rotated to a certain angle, we could find the cosine and sine of that angle. To find the new x and y coordinates of a vector rotated by some angle alpha, we looked at a geometric proof which ended up in a system of equations, which eventually became our rotation matrix. After that, we saw that multiplying on computers is actually pretty slow, and we figured out that if we factor out a cosine from our matrix, so our matrix has just the tangent of alpha, and then choose angles whose tangents are powers of 2, then all we'd have to do to find the new x and y coordinates of a rotated vector is shift the digits and add. Finally, we checked that this new series of angles would still work with our algorithm by making sure that we could still cover the full unit circle and that the series converged. All right, now that all the pieces are in place, let's take a look at how this algorithm actually runs. Let's say we want to find the sine and cosine of 55 degrees. We'll start with a vector on the x-axis of length 1. 
Since the current angle we're at, 0 degrees, is less than the angle we want, 55 degrees, we'll rotate in the positive direction. We'll add the angle we just rotated to our theta value, and we'll calculate the new x and y values using our rotation matrix. You might notice that our new vector isn't actually of length 1 anymore. That's because of the cosine that we factored out earlier, that constant k in the front. Since all it's doing is scaling the vector and not affecting the angle of it, we can deal with it at the end. If we keep rotating our vector, rotating forwards if the angle is less than the desired angle, and backward if it's more, we'll eventually converge to that desired angle. And again, since our series of angles are only angles whose tangents are powers of 2, the only operations we're doing to find the new x and y coordinates are shifts of digits and additions. After 10 iterations, the angle we've reached seems pretty close to the desired angle. So our x and y coordinates should be pretty accurate. But because we factored a cosine out of our rotation matrix, it made it so that each rotation we did wasn't actually a perfect rotation. It actually stretched our vector a little bit. If we can calculate this constant k, we can multiply it by the x and y coordinates at the end, and then finally get the actual cosine and sine of our angle. This constant is equal to all of the cosines that we factored out from all of our matrices multiplied together. Since the angles we're rotating by are just positive or negative of the same angles each time, that means that this cosine value is gonna be constant. So we can calculate it beforehand, and doing so we get 0 0.607253. If we multiply this by our x and y coordinates, we'll get the actual cosine and sine of our angle. Going backwards, if we have the x and y coordinates of a vector, we can also use this algorithm to find the angle and the magnitude of the vector. Okay, let's use this one more time to calculate the sine and cosine of 37 degrees. The algorithm I just showed you is called the Cordic algorithm, which means Coordinate Rotation Digital Compute. And it's often used in integrated circuits with limited hardware, where speed is more important than accuracy. While it might not be important that you actually know how this algorithm works, I think the ideas behind it are super interesting and super useful in other contexts. Plus, besides sine, cosine, and inverse tangent, variations of this algorithm can be used to calculate things like square roots, natural logarithms, and exponentials. I think the coolest part about this algorithm is how far you can get just by starting from a simple idea, like walking back and forth on a line. Thanks for watching.